the Holy Land, Syria, Mesopotamia, and Asia proper are manifestly countries of Eden. But in the beginning, Eden contained a garden, Pardes, or Paradise. So also, in the beginning of the millennial aeon, the same Eden will rejoice in a paradise adopted to the necessities and enjoyment, not of two persons only, but of a great multitude which no man can number. Revelation 7 verse 9 Adam and Eve's paradise was upon a small scale, yet ample enough for them. From its mosaic geography, no other locality, I believe, can be reasonably assigned to it than between the Gulf of Persia and the confluence of the four rivers named. The text reads, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was divided, and became into four heads. This I understand to mean that a river, formed by the confluence of four others flowing out of Eden, was caused to water the garden on its way to the sea, and that, tracing this river northward from the garden, it diverged into its tributaries, which terminated in four several heads. The heads were not in the garden, but at remote distances from it. Therefore they err who locate Adam's paradise at the heads, or original sources of the Tigris and Euphrates, in the mountains of Armenia. A warmer climate was necessary for the comfortable existence of two naked persons. The heads, I say, were not in the garden, for it was watered by one only, as it is written, a river went out to water it, which certainly excludes the four from its enclosure. From subsequent developments in the history of their posterity, the Babylonian region of Eden was a very appropriate locality for the origination of sin, which is the transgression of law. In the Adamic paradise was laid the foundation of that gigantic system of iniquity, which is styled apocalyptically, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. The principle, which may be termed the vital principle of this mystery, is disobedience. Adam's paradise was the birthplace of this principle, and at once the arena of the serpent's victory and defeat. The individual serpent prevailed and was cursed in the paradise of the first Adam. So also he has prevailed and is destined to be bruised in the paradise of the second. The serpent principles embodied in the power symbolized by the goats and his five horns, Daniel 8 verses 8 and 9, have thus far prevailed. The power has desolated the holy land and made it a field of blood. But this fair portion of Eden is not always to lie in ruins under the serpent dominion. For the sentence is, Thy head, O serpent, the woman's seed shall bruise. The dominion will therefore be destroyed, and the holy land in Eden of the east be delivered from the enemy. That the holy land is to become the paradise of the deity is manifest from the following testimonies, which every one acquainted with the history of Eden, in whole or in part, knows have never yet been accomplished. Thus the Spirit saith, Thy land, O Zion, shall no more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, that is, my beloved is in her, and thy land, Bula, that is, married. For Yahweh delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. 
For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thine Elohim rejoice over thee. Isaiah 62, verses 4 and 5. Here Zion and the Holy Land are represented as a virgin bride, and the Elohim, or Messiah, and his brethren in their one spirit body manifestation as the bridegroom. This virgin bride and her bridegroom are the loving couple, whose loves are celebrated by Solomon in his Song of Songs. The land, in its paradisaic development, is typified in his garden enclosed, and which, as king, he styles my sister spouse, as already quoted. This is the literal, which is also allegorical, of something more recondite, as hereafter will be shown. At present, we have to do chiefly with the geomaterial aspects of the subject. When the marriage or union between the sons of Zion and their king as the bridegroom, and the holy land as the virgin bride, comes to pass, the country will become the paradise of Yahweh, which his own right hath planted. Thus the Spirit saith, Yahweh shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of Yahweh. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Isaiah 51 verse 3 Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to Yahweh for a renown, for a memorial of the olam, which shall not be cut off. Isaiah 55 verse 13 At that time I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shittar tree, and the myrtle tree, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, and the pine, and the box together that they, Israel, may see, and know, and consider, and understand together, that the hand of Yahweh hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Isaiah 41, verses 17 to 20. Lastly, upon this point, Ezekiel's testimony may be adduced. As thus saith Adonai Yahweh, In the day that I shall have cleansed you, O Israel, from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities fenced and inhabited. Then the nations that are left round about you shall know that I, Yahweh, build the ruined places, and plant that that was desolate. I, Yahweh, have spoken it, and will do it. Ezekiel 36 verse 33 When thus converted into paradise, the same prophet tells us that there will be a river that cannot be passed over by wading, and that it will be formed by a confluence of waters springing out from under the threshold of the temple eastward, from its right side at the south of the altar. Chapter 47, verses 1 to 5. He then informs us that, on the bank of the river, was a great wood, Eitzrav, both words in the singular number, on the one side 
and on the other. The waters issue from Mount Moriah down its south side, and flow on toward the east through a vast cleft in the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, verses 4 and 8. When they have passed this valley, they divide into two rivers, the one flowing through the desert and emptying into the Dead Sea, and the other into the Mediterranean, both of them abundant and never-failing streams. The effect of the eastern river upon the Dead Sea will be to heal its waters. Both streams are healing waters, for the prophet says that it shall be that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the two rivers shall come, shall live, and there shall be very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they of the Dead Sea shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall be that the fishers shall stand upon it, from Engedi even unto Eniglaim. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, or Mediterranean, exceeding many. And by the river on the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall come up every tree for food, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be exhausted. For its months it shall yield, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for food, and the leaf thereof for healing. After these statements, the Spirit then proceeds to point out the boundaries of paradise. He commences the line from the Mediterranean, at the outlet of the Orontes, called the Entering in to Hamath, and passes on in a direct course of 133 miles to Berothar upon the Euphrates. This is marked out as the natural boundary on the north by the range of mountains, called Amanus, which, as a natural barrier, extends across the country from the great Mediterranean Sea to Berothar, to which the Euphrates is navigable from the Persian Gulf. When Messiah is enthroned king of the land and proceeds to take possession of it to its utmost limits, he will then say to his companions, Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shenir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Song 4 verse 8 Taking up their position upon that commanding border, the sons of Zion may view the landscape of a goodly and glorious land, fragrant of rich odours and flowing with milk and honey, outstretching eastward in all the length of Euphrates to the East Sea. This is its border on the east. From the junction of the Euphrates with the Persian Gulf in latitude 30 degrees, the frontier is drawn from Tamar to Meribah of Kadesh, to the river towards the Great or Mediterranean Sea. This is the south border of Paradise, a line of over a thousand miles abutting upon the Nile and thence to the sea, and affording free access to the Red Sea by the Elanitic Gulf. The boundary on the west shall be the Great Sea from the border south till a man come over against the entering into Hamath. Thus, we have an ample area, containing by estimation 300,000 square miles for the length and breadth of Emmanuel's land, extending, as covenanted to Abraham and his seed, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, for a possession in the Olam. Genesis 15, verse 18. 
Such is the territorial paradise, or kingdom of the deity, which all the prophets testify shall be inhabited by the twelve tribes of Israel and their nobles, all of them priests and kings, with Messiah preeminent in all things over all. The twelve tribes will have had a new heart given them, and a new spirit put within them, by the refining process they will have been previously subjected to. Their present stony heart will have been abolished, and a heart of flesh substituted in its stead, as it is testified in Ezekiel 26, verses 25 to 32. Then, for the first time since their revolt from the house of David in the days of his grandson Rehoboam, they will again become one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. They will then rejoice in Jesus of Nazareth as high priest upon the throne of his father David after the order of Melchizedek for the season and a time or Olam, of a thousand years. The former troubles will all be forgotten, and they will no more be made a reproach among the nations. Joel 2 verse 19 Under this new and glorious constitution of the Hebrew kingdom, the tribes will be settled in paradise, in parallel cantonments, extending across the country from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates. Dan's canton is the first, reckoning from the north border. Then Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, and Judah. This brings us down to the midst of the paradise of the deity. South of Judah is the four-square oblation, a holy portion of the land containing the sanctuary, the most holy, the holy portion for the Levites, and the profane place for the city, for dwelling and for suburbs. On the east and west is the prince's portion, the four-square oblation being in his portion, and bounded north by the canton of Judah, and south by that of Benjamin. Thus, Yahweh shall inherit in the canton of Judah his portion upon the land of holiness and shall delight in Jerusalem again. Zechariah 2 verse 12 The holy oblation and prince's portion being thus reckoned of the canton of Judah. The holy oblation is to contain the millennial temple described by Ezekiel which is to be in the midst of the most holy portion of the oblation. Upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit whereof is most holy. Chapter 43, verse 12. The details are given in chapter 45, verses 1 to 8, which concludes with the remark that in the land shall be his, Messiah the Prince's, possession in Israel, And my princes, who will then be the saints, shall no more oppress my people, and the rest of the land shall they give to the house of Israel according to their tribes. The city, which will be square, will be 4,500 measures on each side, or 18,000 in circumference. Its twelve gates will be open into suburbs of 250 measures broad, And to the east and west there will be areas of 10,000 measures each, making altogether a profane place of 25,000 measures from east to west, by 5,000 from north to south, which shall be for the whole house of Israel. And the name of the city from that day shall be Yahweh Shammah, because he who shall be is there. Next to the holy oblation, a portion is allotted to Benjamin, and successively afterwards to Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, and Gad, 
which is the most southerly of all the tribes. Such is the area of paradise from north to south and from east to west, a royal domain larger than that of any kingdom or empire of Europe, Russia alone excepted. It exceeds in the aggregate amount of square miles the territories of ten kingdoms of Europe, as Prussia, Belgium, the Netherlands, Bavaria, Saxony, Hanover, Württemberg, Denmark, Sardinia, and Greece, and its relative proportion to Great Britain and Ireland is 300 to 118, or more than two and a half to one. The situation of paradise is peculiar in relation to its borders. The Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf form on the west, the south, and the east borders of a land which, but for these inland seas, would be wholly encircled by Asia, Africa, and Europe, and shut out from all direct communication with the Pacific and Atlantic, and lesser oceans of the globe. The river of Egypt to the Mediterranean, and that sea from the mouth of the Nile to the estuary of the Orontes, and the Euphrates from the foot of Amanus to the Persian Gulf, leave not the smallest portion of the west side or of the east side that is not actually or virtually a navigable coast to the extent on both sides of 2,000 miles, while on the north the intermediate barrier of Amanus, at the breadth of less than 100, renders the land a garden enclosed. No country could be better situated for the establishment of a kingdom whose sovereignty is destined to rule all nations, peoples and tribes, inhabiting the land and sea to their utmost bounds. Such, then, are the geographical and the literal of the paradise of deity. It belongs to the earth, and is as real, visible and actual a region as Britain or America. The literal paradise, however, differs from these in that its literality is also symbolical and allegorical of things pertaining to that great incorporation of the citizens of the Commonwealth of Israel, styled by Daniel and other sacred writers, the saints. Thus its literal river is symbolical of the spirit to be received from the throne, and through the altar Jesus, by the trees of righteousness that come out of the earth by resurrection. Ezekiel's river is therefore placed among the apocalyptical symbols of Revelation 22 verse 1. So also its eight Rav, or great wood, on both sides of his river, is styled the Xulon on this side and that side of the river of water of life, and representative of the aggregate of the saints, each saint being an element of the wood. The leaf of the Ezekiel wood is for healing. As an apocalyptic symbol, it is representative of the saints, who are leaves as well as trees of the Xulon of life, through whom the Spirit breathes for the healing of the nations, symbolised by the waters of the Dead Sea. To eat of the wood of the life in the midst of the paradise of the deity is to be an unfading leaf, an immortal possessor of the glory, honour and incorruptibility of the kingdom, which the God of heaven shall set up in the holy land. It is to be one of the priests of the most holy portion of the holy oblation, to whom it shall be said by the king, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the state. Matthew 25, verse 34.
34. Verse 34.